Hello, welcome, and thank you for being a part of WorkSafe's Keeping Apprentices Safe at Work webinar. My name is Cameron Ling, and I'll be your host for this session. This morning, we'll explore the following topics. Why considered and careful supervision of apprentices is so important for health and safety, morale, and performance. The practical steps employers can take to keep young staff safe, and also tools and resources available for employers and employees to learn about what they can do. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by three experts. Peter Booth, Senior Construction Advisor with WorkSafe Victoria. Good morning, Peter. Morning, Cam. How are you, mate? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Joining Peter this morning is Stephanie Veal, CEO of Victorian Registration and Qualifications Authority, or VRQA. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Cameron. Great to be here. Great to have you with us. Also with us is Professor Helen Lingard, Executive Director of the newly formed RMIT Safety and Health Innovation Network. Good morning, Helen. Morning, Cameron. Thanks for having me. No, thanks so much for joining us uh, and all three of you for joining us this morning. Uh, we are going to be taking questions a little bit later on for our audience. So please feel free at any stage to start entering your questions in to the Q&A chat box. Uh, Peter, to get things started, I'd love to start with you. You've worked as a carpenter on building sites and have been a WorkSafe inspector now for five years. Why is proper supervision of apprentices so important? Yeah, it's a great question, Cameron. Um, supervision of apprentices, it's not the simplest thing. Uh, it's not straightforward. Every apprentice is going to be slightly different. But poor supervision means poor teaching, which means the building of poor habits. And as we know, Bad habits are very hard to break. That's the reason why I'm not getting to the gym as often as I should. I'd rather go to bed early. Um, that being said, even when the apprentices do prove themselves to be very competent within their working frame, for so for the, an example, so an electrician working, apprentice electrician works a solar install, he might be very competent in a lot of the work involving the solar installation itself. That's going to be his focus. It's everything around that that he might not be aware of. He might not be aware that, yes, we're working on this pitch today because this is the pitch that has the full protection erected. We have to then pull that down and put it on the other side. By being left alone, we're um, setting him up to potentially move to the other side of that roof where we don't have that full protection er erected. Um, and that's why we don't like to see apprentices supervising apprentices because while they may be very technically competent, they may know the actual building skills, that overall arching space of managing the site, ensuring that all the paperwork for the swims, risk assessments, who to call in the event of emergency might be well and truly over their heads, um, at which point that's not something that's really fair to ask of a young worker with limited experience, such as an apprentice. Yeah, it's a great point you make, uh, Peter. Uh, what are employer obligations when it comes to protecting apprentices and all young workers? So Section 21.2F of the Act is uh, very clear that basically, to give you the, the layman's overview of it, mate, would be that is the obligation to provide instruction, training, and supervision, such as uh, such as necessary to ensure that the employee's workplace is safe and without risk to health. So, by not having once again that correct supervision, by not providing that right instruction to undertake a task, on top of potentially not giving the apprentice the best start in the world, you're also opening yourself up legally to the consequences. Um, one we always like to say when it comes to being told oh, he's an apprentice, he's competent, he's fine to do it, he's been here for three years, is think about saying that, but then put your honour on the end of it because that may very well be the situation if something is to go wrong here. What are the benefits of good supervision, though, to employers? Yeah, good supervision can be really good. A, it means the employer has a really good understanding of where the apprentice is at, their skills and whatnot. Um, they know exactly what they're doing. They know their competencies. And you know how they feel. You know if they're in a good mood or a bad mood, what makes them tick. You can keep an eye on them. Um, a happy apprentice is generally going to be a more productive and more open to learning apprentice than someone who's potentially overworked and fatigued. If they're not being supervised properly, not only are they probably not getting the teaching of the skills at the level that you would like them to get, um, they can, at which point they could be a real asset or they could be someone who's potentially overworked, who's not going to make it through their four-year apprenticeship because they are overworked, because they're not happy in what they're doing. Uh, flowing on from this, Stephanie, if I could come to you, what is the role of the VRQA in all of this? 
Thanks, Cameron. So the VRQA is Victoria's education and training regulator. Uh, we approve employers of apprentices and trainees, and together with our co-regulators like WorkSafe, we ensure apprentices and trainees are protected um, from harms, harm, um, you know, to their safety, both physical and um, psychological, and uh, also harm of um, poor training. Um, we also register training contracts in Victoria um, and we make sure employers are meeting their obligations to apprentices and, and trainees and you know critically that includes um, providing appropriate supervision um, and that that supervision um, is by someone who has the right qualifications and skills and expertise. Um, em employers also need to give their apprentices and trainees time away from work, so to attend TAFE or their or the RTO to do their training, um, and then monitor their apprentices and trainees' progress and their competency to ensure they're able to complete their qualification. Continuing on from that, uh, how do you do all of that? Um, so we regularly, regularly monitor um, different industries. We do that um, with our authorised officers going out to um, work places. Um, one of the key ways we do this is through targeted campaigns. Um, currently, we've got a joint campaign with the Labor Hire Authority looking at um, protecting apprentices and trainees that are employed through labour hire arrangements and protecting them from exploitation. Um, our dedicated hotline opens on the 6th of November and apprentices and trainees can contact us uh, and can remain anonymous if they'd, if they'd like to. Um, we also work really closely with our, our co-regulators where we share information and, um, and data and respond to um, complaints um, from apprentices and trainees or the public. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Helen, if I could come over to you now. You specialise in studying the role of apprentice supervision in the construction sector. Why is supervision so critical for apprentices in this industry particularly? Yeah, thanks, Cameron. Obviously, construction is a high-risk industry and apprentices learn how to work from their supervisors. So the supervisors are really critical role models and teachers. And if supervisors take shortcuts in relation to safety, well, the apprentices will learn from that and possibly even come to think that it's expected of them. So they, uh, the supervision of apprentices is really, really important in that regard. Supervisors also need to ensure that apprentices have um, the appropriate um, experience and instruction. They need to learn the craft um, that they're, they're learning. Um, and importantly, Research shows that um, when apprentices have a good relationship with their supervisors, they're much more likely to complete their apprenticeship. And, and when they have a poor relationship, they're more likely to drop out. Um, and we also know that when a, uh, supervisors are approachable, uh, apprentices are also less likely to take risks in the workplace. You ran a project called Conversations About Life, Health and Safety, Social Supports for Young Construction Workers, Health and Safety. Perhaps can you tell us about it and why you saw the need for it? Sure. So the project was funded by iCare in New South Wales, and it sought to create resources to improve communication uh, between apprentices and supervisors. It was motivated by the literature review that showed how important supervisor and apprenticeship communication is as being a critical determinant of apprentices staying safe in the workplace, as well as their mental well-being. We know that supervisors in the construction industry are usually really tech technically very competent and capable, but they rarely have training in soft skills associated with communication and the provision of support. So we were really trying to sort of plug that gap, if you like. How did the project roll out? So in the first phase of the project, we interviewed 30 apprentices and 11 supervisors. And the purpose of those interviews was to actually find out what good supervision and good communication looked like. Um, we found a really good example. So we had one supervisor, for example, who took, took his apprentice ocean swimming each morning um, before work to help him manage his mental well-being. But in, 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 unfortunately, some supervisors were, were less um, supportive of their apprentices and some adopted a very laissez-faire approach and, and, and left their supervisor, left their, left their 
apprentices unsupervised in some situations. And in some cases, supervisors were aggressive uh, and even you know, um, yelled at their apprentices um, or asked them inappropriate questions about their private lives. So we found this mixed bag, if you like, of how supervisors were behaving. Uh, and we wanted to develop these resources to help supervisors as well as apprentices to develop their communication skills to enable them to have a respectful and supportive communication and help apprentices feel comfortable and able to speak up about safety concerns they might have in the workplace. Helen, if I could just dig a little bit further, what supervision styles did you notice? Which were some positive traits and behaviours for supervisors and apprentices? Sure. So supervisors who were really good at, at, at those aspects of their work were consistent in the health and safety messages that they gave. They were approachable. They showed good listening skills. They used a participatory management style and they showed emotional intelligence. They were responsive if, if apprentices asked questions or raised concerns uh, and dealt with them respectfully and showed a lot of empathy. And on the other side, apprentices who had good communication skills were assertive uh, and, and asked questions if they felt they needed to. They were confident. Um, they were actively interested in learning about things that could help ha affect their health and safety. And they would speak up if they, if they felt that there was something perhaps unsafe or something they didn't understand. The project led to development of a game that we have a short video about. Helen, perhaps could, could you tell us about the three scenarios we're about to see? Sure. So the game comprises three scenarios, and each of these stories was built on the lived experience and things that actually happened to the apprentices who, who we interviewed in the study. Um, and we built these scenarios to try and teach the uh, supervisors and apprentices different communication skills that were identified in the interviews as being good for apprentices' health and safety. So, for example, in the first scenario, the apprentice arrives late for work and the supervisor can make a decision as to whether he yells at the apprentice or whether um, it, they, they want to you know, uh, be more tolerant and, and ask if everything's okay. The decisions that are made in the scenarios lead to outcomes and those outcomes um, create uh, the opportunity to learn about what good communication looks like. The second scenario shows issues of respectful behavior and how a supervisor might respond to situations of bullying or harassment. And the third scenario, scenario deals with um, a situation where an apprentice um, has to uh, negotiate difficult work-life boundaries and how supervisors might, might be supportive in that environment. Thanks, Helen. Uh, let's have a look at the video. If you're going to be late tomorrow, don't even bother coming in, all right? Maybe you should join me at the gym sometime. We'll get your hot body to match your face. Actually, to be honest, I kind of struggle with heights sometimes. It's not like it's a skyscraper. Oi, oi. You got it. Stephanie, if I could come to you now, in scenarios that Helen has just outlined, what would your comments be? Thanks, Cameron. Uh, I think it's really important um, to remember that, you know, apprentices and trainees can be really um, vulnerable and there's a power imbalance. So it's often their first job um, and, you know, they uh, really need to be supported uh, to speak up and to understand um, what their rights are um, and, you know, what's um, right in the, in the workplace. So uh, really critical and I think the video highlights that about how important it is for employers um, and a and their apprentices or trainees um, to have effective communication and employers to support their apprentices and trainees. Peter, how is WorkSafe supporting employers and their apprentices to keep workplaces safe and healthy across Victoria? So WorkSafe has developed what we call the WorkWell Toolkit. It's designed for companies of all different sizes. It has a lot of really easy templates and things to potentially apply in the mental health space, which can really help with potentially retaining a, uh, an apprentice and dealing with potentially those harder conversations that come with 
younger workers coming into the workforce. Um, there's also a young workers web page that can sort of help you out with that as well. Um, Energy Safe Victoria put out a really good document on supervision of apprentices in the electrical trades. While that's obviously not going to be applicable directly to all trades, it does sort of lay out what sort of supervision is required across these tasks. Um, most tradesmen will roughly have an idea of where the higher risk jobs are when they do take on the apprentice. Can be a really good guide to potentially set out to say, for in the instance of say a plumber or a gas fitter, we're doing gas work, that's going to require direct supervision and we shouldn't be touching it until we're at least the fourth year. Um, additionally, you can always call the WorkSafe Advisory Service. Um, sometimes you might use it to potentially raise some oh and issues if, you know, the building you're working for or something is making things untenable as far as supervision of your apprentice goes. But you can also just reach out for advice on anything you'd like to have answered. Generally, if the lovely people in advisory can't answer it, they'll send it on to someone like myself who is an expert in the field um, to then gen give you a really good answer and some good guidance on where to go. Great. Thanks for that, uh, Peter. Before we move into our audience question and answer, do you have any takeouts for our audience today? Starting with you, Peter. I would say try and keep a good, happy apprentice will stay on and they'll become a really good asset for your, co for your company potentially in the future. Um, you only get out what you put in when it comes to apprentices. Really good support can really lead to an exceptional apprentice. Um, if you just want to do survival of the fittest, you're going to be left with whatever rem remains. It's a great point. Thanks that, Peter. And Stephanie, what would you like employers to action back in the workplace around the safety of their apprentices? Thanks, Cameron. So really critical, ensuring they're appropriately supervising their apprentices um, to keep them um, safe from harm and, and risks on the in the workplace. Um, and talking to their apprentices about the work they're doing, about, you know, potential um, risks and the importance of workplace safety um, and really having that ongoing conversation with um, their employees and their apprentices um, so that there's that opportunity for um, young people who are apprentices to bring up any workplace safety issues or concerns they have. And you, Helen, what is your advice for employers with apprentices or young workers? Yes, yeah, thanks, Cameron. I think it's important to recognise, <clears throat> excuse me, that workplace health and safety isn't just about the physical work environment, it's the social work environment as well. And it's important that the social environment um, uh, provides respectful, supportive and, and, and good learning opportunities for young workers. I think it's also important to think about possibly educating supervisors as well, so they understand the consequences of their communication styles and behaviours. And lastly, remember what it was like to be a young worker and sometimes try and put yourself back in the, the, the person's shoes, um, because it can be quite daunting as a young worker entering a, a new industry. I think that last point's a great point, Helen. Thank you so much for that. I'd love to get to some of the questions now from our audience. You can continue to enter your questions into the Q&A chat box there. I will try my best to direct the, the questions to the right person, but please feel free to jump in if you've got anything else to add or if somebody's best equipped to answer the question. Uh, this first one, I might ask you, Peter, with this one, does supervision mean being right there all the time? Can a supervisor just be in the area and available? Yeah, that's all. That's a really good one to sort of follow on from the Energy Safe um, document. So, Energy Safe basically defines supervision as direct, broad, um, and indirect. So, these three levels will be applied based on where the apprentice actually <laughs> is. So, for instance, your direct supervision that will generally be your first year, the person, the individual who's going to need to be sort of watched pretty closely at all times. Um, that would be sort of, for example, in the same room, same section of the building. Um, the next one being that broader supervision, yeah, you can be on the same site, but you're easily contactable. Um, essentially, if they need to come and find you, they can come and find you physically quite easily for any advice or something like that. The indirect, that's sort of your, where we start to talk about, okay, you're off site, but you're reachable by phone. Um, that one's really important that you are reachable by phone. Don't go off site, start quoting jobs, start taking meetings and whatnot. We do expect you to be reached. It's unfortunately far too common in that scenario to have people that can't actually be reached because not getting that advice can be something that really leads to an apprentice who's not 100% certain of either the task or the hazards 
not being able to reach you when they do need that guidance, that advice that uh, to complete the trial safely. Great, thanks for that, uh, Peter. Next question here, and I, and I might need a little bit of help with the odd acronym here as well. Um, and feel free, any of you, to jump into this one. NECA have supervision ratios for electrical apprentices depending on the type of tasks they are doing. Is there similar guides for plumbers, carpenters, etc.? Unfortunately, not that I'm aware of. Um, as NECA themselves, NECA, uh, being an employer body of the uh, electrical field, they sort of dovetail into that same Energy Safe Victoria document around supervision. They do have really good, really quite clear, well set out guidelines around what supervision is. Um, plumbing, carpentry, trades along those lines, they can be really difficult because they are really broad terms and definitions of the work that they're actually doing. Um, unfortunately, I mean, that's pretty much a long way, the really long answer of saying, no, not really, um, but, or not that I'm aware of, but yes. Great, thanks for that. Peter, uh, next one here, a number of people wanting the answer to this one. And again, I, I don't know who to direct it to exactly, so please jump in. How can small to medium-sized companies manage the draft proposal for one-to-one -one apprentice supervision without reducing apprentice numbers? Who wants that one? <laughs> Let everyone jump in at once. Um, yeah, look, I think... At any time when you are quite, if you sort of do go through those documents and you sort of look at where that one-to-one -one guidance is actually required over the span of the work, that would be sort of where you could potentially open yourself up to, for instance, uh, in the electrical space, okay, we have to do commissioning. That is going to be a one-to-one -one day. But on the other side, on the other hand, we're doing unpowered fit off on another site where we only require broad supervision of second years. So if you sort of stagger your apprentices, you don't have a whole bunch of fourth years sitting there that you want to do commissioning or vice versa. You don't have a whole bunch of first years that need to be supervised. Um, I think there's definitely something to sort of say the sequencing of your jobs or the timing of your jobs could potentially put you in a position where you can actually line up to have that sufficient um, supervision. There's not a, oh, there are a few tasks that do require that direct one-on-one -on -one supervision with apprentices, but I wouldn't say that they would comprise the bulk of the work. Right, thank you, Peter. Stephanie, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think I, I was just going to add to that and um, to what Peter was saying that, you know, I think um, employers and when they're, um, if they are appointing supervisors to supervise apprentices they've really got to think about you know the task that the apprentice is undertaking and you know the and the potential risks um you know and make a, de a decision that's um appropriate thinking about you know ensuring the uh, safety and well-being of their apprentice um and you know also making sure that um, the apprentice is getting the training that they need um in order to you know do the task and then progress um and become more competent helen i might come to you on this next one just given some of the things that you you spoke about um and it's a, a really good question so it's just dropped off my screen here this is lots of questions coming through. Here it is. As a middle-aged employer, do you have any tips for dealing with and communicating with young workers? That's a very good question. And in fact, that's actually very much where our research was, was focused because we were dealing with, with older workers who were supervising, you know, young, very young workers in, in, in some instances. And, and that generation gap is, 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 is problematic because it's easy, to my point, it's easy to forget what it was like when you were young um, and to assume that young people will feel able to speak up um, when in fact the research shows that sometimes older workers can unintentionally systematically silence young workers and make them feel like they, 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 they can't ask questions about safety or, or raise concerns or, 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 or ask questions even about how to do work. If, if they've been shown once and they don't quite get it, you know, rather than actually leave them and, and assume they've, they've got it, just, just to actually you know, show them again if they need that extra support and, and, and instruction. And I think that, big, that, that last point I made about being empathetic and, and actually trying to put yourself in their shoes is, is really important. And if, 
it, it gives them make sure that the opportunities are there for them to 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 question and to 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 ask give from extra information and, and assistance if if and when they need it. One of the things that our role playing training tool did when we did an experiment with it with 150 apprentices and some older workers who were business owners when the business owners played the the, the game if I training tool that we developed when we interviewed them afterwards one of the big things that they said was gosh I now remember what it was like to be a young worker because they were able to put themselves back in the shoes of that young worker and and understand from the perspective of the young worker what it was like uh, to feel not so comfortable asking asking questions or voicing concerns. So I think that that empathy thing is really important. And, 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 and that's something which everyone can learn to be, but not necessarily, we, we don't necessarily always, always demonstrate that behavior. So to my point about, you know, training supervisors in, in those skills, I think it's actually really important. Great. Thanks that, Helen. Uh, Peter, I might come to you on this one, uh, just for a bit of clarification a few people need. What does supervision holding the appropriate qualifications and training actually mean? I.e. only a qualified electrician can supervise an electrical apprentice. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. So suitably qualified. I mean, as I, once again, if we sort of look back at that electrical one, because it's a really great example with that great document from Energy Safe, um, you would need someone who's qualified in electrical to supervise an apprentice doing something along the lines of say decomm uh, commissioning, decommissioning, powering up, that sort of stuff. Uh, generally, I would say that if we were potentially looking at sort of that non-trade based stuff, cleaning up, um, even doing things like quoting and whatnot, or looking at quotes, uh, which was something I was uh, sent into the office to learn while I was an apprentice, that could then potentially be your estimator in the office who sort of goes through, this is how we figure out a job. Um, which is all really good experience for an apprentice because they will be in that situation. If they're doing things such as mechanical work or cleaning work or something like that, uh, mechanical work, for example, in the electrical space being the installation of rails for a solar install, potentially having someone there that has the experience um, as a project manager or a building man or a site manager, just to ensure that they're working in accordance with those safety systems might be might be enough. Great, thanks for that, Peter. Um, Stephanie, can I come to you on this one? Uh, what are the benefits of employing mature age apprentices? Great, great question, um, Cameron. And um, you know, I think the panel today has has touched on on some of um, the benefits um, around. You know, mature age apprentices can um, come with already some great um, life experience and um, and expertise, uh, and you know, also really key. Um, be in the workplace um, and you know the uh, apprentices are, are you know a fantastic way apprenticeships fantastic way for people um, to learn on the job and then you know a real asset to employers who take the time to you know appropriately supervise and train them um, so yeah I think that's a that's a win win the mature age apprentice for everyone. Great, thanks, that Stephanie. Uh, next question here: A few people wanting the answer to a real tricky one. Uh, I'm going to open it up to all three of you. Any tips on managing the conflict between doing work and being on social media? <laughs> Do you want that one, Peter? Uh, look, honestly, I, I have got some experience in this. I've only been off the tools for five years. Um, so, for instance, there was a project I worked on where we had a real issue with. I was basically the leading hand for the, the carpentry subcontractor on the site. Um, and the builder had a real issue with my guys being on their phones. Um, I will say this, all of, we would take photos of plans on our phones and I would send them out. That was how I communicated with my guys. So I would say, while people do sort of get on young, younger people around being on their phones all the time or people on site being on their phones all the time, there is the potential that you can take that and use that as a really handy tool for yourself um the social media side of things um as one one person told me 10 years ago i had to tell them to get their nose out the form guide now i have to tell them to get off their phones um it is something that's changed that sort of engagement side of things i think it just comes down to 
as I said, engagement. Um, are they doing something that is mind-numbingly boring? Are they doing the same thing day in, day out? Do you potentially need to look at, okay, well, maybe we're going to send you to the office to look at how we go, oh, come into the office for a day. We're going to look at how we quote. We're going to look at this. We're going to look at that. That's the sort of stuff that should that hopefully can potentially put in a met, that level of mental engagement that will hopefully have the apprentice in a position where they really want to look at, okay, now I can see the whole process through and this is how it all works when it all comes together. Stephanie, Helen, do you have anything to add to this very tricky subject? I think that's that's a very tricky subject. And I think um, Peter's nailed it around, you know, well, looking at well, how do we keep the um, apprentice engaged? So, you know, giving them meaningful work um, and challenging work so that they're able to, um, you know, remain engaged, but also, you know, building their, um, their competency. Um, you know, I think, uh, look, you know, no matter what um, workplace, young people are in, they're going to be on social media, but, you know, you'd also need to think about, well, is it distracting them from, um, you know, making sure they're safe on the site? So, you know, sometimes you'd need to think about, well, are there some boundaries or rules you, you want to put in place depending on the workplace? And I'd add to that, I think a, a good supervisor can, you know, a, a supportive supervisor, a respectful supervisor can can intervene and correct that behaviour and, and point out that, you know, that, that there are you know, practices and appropriate behaviours in a site environment and, and inappropriate behaviours. And, and, and I think that's part of the learning and mentoring um, that supervisors should be providing for the apprentices. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, Peter, I'll come back to you on, on this one. What resources can we access to help us with these requirements? Who can we call or where can we get this information? Uh, yeah, so you can call WorkSafe on, uh, straight through the advisory line. Um, they will potentially try to give you advice if they can answer the question straight off the bat. If they can't, they can potentially forward it on to someone like myself who does have experience in whatever field. In whatever field it is, obviously, uh, being a qualified carpenter, I'm probably not the person to speak to electrical hazards, but we do have several members of our organisation who are former electricians. That's definitely one that you can go to. The Apprenticeships Board of Victoria can offer a really handy resource, um, especially with that really complex stuff. My apprentice isn't engaged. I'm struggling to get him, that sort of stuff. And from the welfare side of things, once again, I cannot speak highly enough of that work well toolkit. We don't always get everything right, but I think we really nailed that one. I might ask this question to you, Helen, perhaps, because it's a little bit on, on what you've been working on, you've spoken about today. Getting young workers to connect with health and safety messages is a bit of a challenge. Any real solutions you've seen work? That's a very good question. Um, and I think one of the things that we have discovered is that young workers don't necessarily want to go and look for information and read it and spend time, you know, reading written documents for, for, for you know, uh, and even sitting in training and being, you know, taught about about the sorts of things that that our tool um, dealt with, um, the, the, the apprentices who actually engaged with the materials that we developed, which which used a role play based gamified training approach. The, the apprentices who trialed it, and we trialed it with 150 apprentices, we surveyed them before they ran, they, they used the training tool and we surveyed them again at the end. Um, and, and they all made comments about how much they learned, but also not just how much they learned, um, the fact that, that they, they enjoyed it and they felt that they would use what they learned in the workplace. So I, I'm not suggesting that the training tool that we developed is necessarily good for all safety related training, but certainly using that sort of gamified, slightly more um, interactive and immersive um, training approach might be good for young workers who, who, who often don't like the classroom based learning and certainly may not engage with, with, with written documents to the extent that, that we might have previously hoped. Great, thanks for that, Helen. Um, this one I'm going to open up to all three of you again, so please jump in. What are the most important things I can do as a supervisor to help an apprentice in the first few months on the job? Do they just watch me? Do you have some tips? Um, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. No, after you, Helen, I figured I'd jump in before. No, 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 you go. Before Cameron's <laughs> to me again. So, <laughs> oh, yours. 
No, no, sorry. I I, I mistakenly spoke. You, you go. Okay, no worries. Um, so, yeah, I think when it comes to a new apprentice, I think taking the time to, A, understand them, and B, understand where they're coming from. Um, when I first started my apprenticeship, I was 15 years old. Um, I've lived in Geelong all my life, so that meant I was almost certainly playing footy, as you'd imagine. I was playing basketball. I was boxing. I was even fighting in MMA tournaments. Um, I was very fit. But my first three months, I struggled to lift my hands above my head at the end of a day of work. That really constant eight-hour grind, that can really take its toll. That fatigue of getting out of bed when it's dark and coming home when it's dark, particularly in the middle of winter, that can really start to psychologically weigh on somebody and really give them that poor mindset. I think just being aware of, okay, he's, if your apprentice is tired, they are, if, yeah, if the apprentice is tired, Maybe tell them, ask them to take a day. At the end of the day, they're not going to retain knowledge if they're tired, if they're exhausted in those earlier months. Um, if you do need to sort of account for those growing pains, I would think that potentially there's some of the strategies that you can really implement around that space. Great. Thanks for that, Peter. Really appreciate it. Um, this one, another uh, a tricky one, and maybe I'll, I'll steer this one to you, Stephanie, initially. Is it too subjective for supervisors to decide where an apprentice is on their work journey? Apprentices clearly develop professionally at different rates, possibly too challenging for supervisors to understand who does or does not require direct supervision. That's that's a great question, um, Cameron. And, and look, that's true. In Victoria, we have a competency-based um, um, system. And I think that's why it's um, really key that employers, apprentices, and then their, their RTO or their TAFE are all working together and communicating in relation to um, the apprentice's training plan. And, you know, and looking at, well, are they meeting the um, and completing it, the tasks that they need to on the train on the training plan, but also that three way conversation because uh, yeah, people people develop competency um, uh, at different um, stages and at different um, times, um, and so yeah, it's critical that I think ongoing communication and that ongoing check in on the training plan that that remains a living document. It's not just a you know something that's put to the put to the side and so you know that can assist um, employers I think with you know looking at well ha where are they at in terms of um, their qualification and also yeah keeping in touch with their RTO or their TAFE. Great thanks that Stephanie. Uh, Helen, Peter anything to add to that one? Uh, no I thought that was no. uh, very good. well explained Stephanie. Fa fantastic well I might um, come to you perhaps Helen on this one but please again feel free to jump in Peter or Stephanie uh, has there been any studies of the applications of mentors in the workplace not specifically supervisors yes not to my knowledge and it's a good question because no not to my knowledge but but going back to the um to the previous comment that was made about one of the benefits of having older apprentices Certainly in our study, when we went to work workplaces where there were more than one apprentice in the same workplace, where there was an older apprentice, more advanced in, at a higher stage of their apprenticeships, and, and they were, you know, maybe in their, you know, 30s or, or older than the, 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 the young apprentices, we saw them taking a mentorship role quite, quite a lot and, and actually, you know, supporting the younger apprentices and encouraging them to speak up about things and ask questions and engage, uh, uh, you know, in the sorts of interactions we were looking for. So when the younger apprentices didn't feel confident doing that, those older apprentices would step in and, and support them and, and help to build that confidence in them. So um, we haven't, I, I'm not aware of any formal studies I'm not there may well be studies I'm not aware of but um, I think it's a really interesting question and there is an opportunity I think to potentially you know look at that as something that that can help thanks that Helen um, Peter I'll come back to you on this one do you have any tips for performance management of apprentices yeah that's a really great question performance management can be one of the trickiest things to do at what point how do you nicely tell someone that they're probably not where you're expecting them to be at um, I would think number one would be making sure that you're on the right track. I think I'd be potentially contacting the TAFE, their TAFE instructors, 
And just asking the question of, are you finding them where they need to be? Why do you think this is? I think a second set of eyes is always really handy and the TAFE system can be really good for that. I think that when it comes to form management, the important thing is to make sure it's sort of discreet. Discretion um, is such a big part of it without trying to make someone feel singled out, but also trying to get them to the level they need to be. Um, do we need to have a site toolbox where everyone's told that Roger, the new apprentice, just isn't meeting his, go uh, meeting his goals or isn't meeting the expectations that we're setting for him? Or do we need to just take Roger aside at the end of the day and say, look, mate, let's say he's a carpenter, for instance. We've had a look at the framing. We're not real happy with where it is. We're just going to put you... We know you're a second year. We expect you to be a bit better than this, but we're just going to give you some really intensive supervision to try and get this up to where it is and keep it between on a need-to-know basis. Nobody else needs to know that you're not happy with that apprentice's progress. If you do air it out in front of everyone, you basically alienate and exclude that particular apprentice from the rest of the workforce. And that's not going to make for a very psychologically healthy environment. That's a great point. Thanks, uh, Peter. This, this next question, I might stay with you, but please jump in, Stephanie or Helen. Um, and I feel like this question is coming from a qualified tradesperson who isn't necessarily the employer. Uh, I haven't received training to be an effective supervisor, and I'm wondering whose responsibility it is to provide this training. Not everyone has the necessary skills for effectively communicating with apprentices. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, if you aren't feeling comfortable with it, there's many, many online courses and things like that you can potentially look into. You can potentially speak to your employer and say, look, this is what I need. At the end of the day, though, when it comes to apprentices, they're people. It's not a one size fits all. Um, for instance, I'm very big on sports and whatnot, and someone who's quite outgoing and loves their sports, I will generally get along with very quickly and very well, because that's my uh, that's sort of where I sit. If someone wants to talk to me about things like computer games and whatnot, I don't spend much time on those. I'm not going to be sort of engaged in that. As a general rule of thumb, I think. Generally, different people have different interests, have different personalities, and a one-size-fits-all, potentially a more introverted apprentice may potentially work quite well with someone who doesn't have that formal training, someone who can simply just have the quiet word to them and just be there when they need them to be, um, whereas an extroverted ap apprentice will potentially need that person who pulls on the lead every now and again when they uh, start to get a bit out of line. Thanks that, Peter. Can I just squeeze this last question into you, Peter, because I'm conscious of time. There are more than just apprentices in construction. Can WorkSafe create tailored videos and posters in the automotive industry? Yeah, that's a really good question. So in my role, I do a lot of work within the TAFEs and the automotive industry is one where we are seeing a massive amount of expansion um, and a massive want to sort of have us come in there and speak to their apprentices. It's definitely an area um, I can't speak to because if we're being completely honest, if I change a tire, I'm having a good day. Um, I just don't have the skills in that set, in that area. I definitely think it's something that uh, we can definitely improve on, and it's something that I can certainly I certainly intend to raise. Um, that being said, it does take quite a while to get guidance out in any industry, just because it requires things like legal review to make sure that all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. It's a really good point. And I would strongly agree with the person that's put it forward that the automotive industry is somewhat of a blind spot at this point. Great. Thanks for that, Peter. Thank you to everyone who's asked questions. I do apologize. We've got a whole lot more there that I haven't got time to get to. I'm sorry that I can't get to your question, um, but we do appreciate everyone who's engaged with us asking all of those questions. Um, thank you so much to Helen Lingard from RMIT. Helen, really appreciate your time today. No worries. Thanks, Cameron. And also a big thanks to Stephanie from VRQA. Stephanie, thank you. Thanks, Cameron. And also Peter Booth from WorkSafe Victoria. Peter, really appreciate your time. Cheers. Thanks very much, Cam. Been a pleasure. Great to have all three of you here sharing your insights today about the crucial importance of supervision for apprentices and less experienced workers. We hope that everybody has found this an interesting and informative session. This webinar will be available on WorkSafe's website in the coming weeks, so please keep an eye out for that. We do value your opinion on our Health and Safety Month events. Shortly, we will be sending you an online survey. We would love it if you could provide your feedback so that we can incorporate your suggestions 
in our program next year. All respondents will go into the draw to win one of five $100 gift cards. Shortly on the screen, you'll see a list of all the contacts or programs that we have covered today for your information. If you need any further information, we recommend you to please get in touch. There is the WorkSafe advisory line that Peter mentioned a number of times. And also don't forget the emergency line is open 24 hours per day, seven days a week. Thank you so much for being a part of today's webinar.